CNF Worldwide, for nomads everywhere. Hello, CNF Worldwide listeners. This is Jason. Um, we are here in gorgeous South Dakota in the Black Hills at the... Black Hills Wild Horse Sanctuary. Excellent. And this is, we rolled up here today and immediately went on a little adventure through some hills to go feed the herd, which was incredible. And I thank you very much for allowing us to join you with that. So we're here with Susan Watt, who is now, what, what, is there a title I'm, involved? I'm, a, I'm the president and the executive director. Mr. Hyde passed away in December and passed the torch to me. And he said to me quite often, I can't leave now because you'll just bring trailer loads of horses in. So I promised him I wouldn't bring trailer loads of horses in but he was here for for 30 years. Oh, wow. I was like, can we expand on that real quick? Yes. So, uh, Mr. Hyde is the one who Mr. Hyde, founded yes. this. Yes, Dayton O'Hyde founded the Black Hills Wild Horse Sanctuary in 1988. But before that, in 1987, he was in Nevada and he saw huge corrals of, of horses that had been rounded, wild horses that had been rounded up on public land managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And he said to himself, this is not the way to treat wild horses. His life, as a child, he left Michigan to go to Oregon to, to be on his uncle's ranch, Yamsey, because his uncle had written a letter that the cowboys just brought in a herd of wild horses and was gonna gentle them in the corral and that he could catch as many fish as he wanted to. <laughs> so who would not stop at a 13 year old going to Oregon to see the wild horses and catch fish. So he went to Oregon and he, he arrived at his uncle's ranch and he, he makes one comment that sticks in my heart. Though he had never ridden a horse and he had boots and he had jeans, but that day he became a cowboy and his life at Yamsey is what brought him to South Dakota, his love of wild horses. So in 1987, at 60 years old, he's in Nevada, buying cattle for his ranch in Oregon, Yamsey, and he sees these wild horses rounded up. And he says, this is not what wild horses, they should not have to live pinned up in a corral. So it took him over a year. He went to Washington and, and met with Congress, had to petition Congress, and they actually had to vote on allowing him to have 300 of the unadoptable wild horses. So that took from 87 until September of 1988 for the horses to arrive here. But in that time period, he had to find some land. So he went to places in, in Oklahoma and he went to places in other parts of the world. But this, the governor, George Mickelson of the state of South Dakota, had heard about what Dayton Hyde was doing and he called him up and he said, why don't you come to South Dakota? I think we have the perfect parcel of land that would make a wonderful wild horse sanctuary. So Dayton flew into Rapid City and they picked him up in a National Guard helicopter and they flew over this piece of land. And this piece of land had been bought by Honeywell in the early 80s for munitions testing to blow up bombs up in the canyon. And some of the locals were happy because that would make economy. Some of the locals were furious and the Native Americans were livid. Absolutely. And so they went up into the canyon and they protested. Our friends in Minneapolis protested and Honeywell finally said, forget this. And so the, the property they had purchased then went to the state of South Dakota Community Foundation. So Governor Mickelson had an idea. Well, why don't we turn this into a wild horse sanctuary? So with the help of the state of South Dakota, the Bureau of Land Management, the South Dakota Community Foundation, and the Institute of Range and American Mustang, which is the illegal name for this nonprofit, they said, okay, we'll do this. Now, it took almost a year because it had to have preparations. He had to make sure he had fences. He had to get Congress to say he could have some horses. So 
The first horses arrived on the property in 1988, in the, in the end of September of 1988, to the other side of the ranch. And he had built 20 miles of fences and lots and lots of preparation to bring the horses here because they didn't know anything about this country. A horse is married to the land. And when you remove them from the land, they have to fall in love with the land again. And so, and now our horses have fallen in love with the land. But in 1988, it was a constant battle to keep them on the property. So 2020 did a 15 minute little blurb on their Friday night program about Dayton Hyde. And I, in living in Alabama, happened to see that episode in 1990. And I thought, wow. I, I would just love to be able to do something like this, but I, I wouldn't know how. Well, I had some, some family members. My husband and my daughter passed away. So in 1995, I'm in a hot air balloon over the Serengeti, <laughs> and I say, okay, universe creator, what is it you want me to do? Bam. Dayton Hyde's face popped into my mind. And I said, okay, if that's what you want me to do. Never mind that I didn't know how to build fences, okay? But I did know people, and I did know horses. So when I got back from Africa, I called him up. It took a month because he never answered the phone, and he invited me out. And so that was ended up being the 1st of December of 1995. And I stayed for a weekend, and I told him I'd come back the end of December, and I did. And so that led me on the journey that I am today. I bought a business in town and I decided that in order for me to really focus on the sanctuary, I managed that bed and breakfast for two and a half years. And then I came here permanently in 1998, moved on the property to help him with, with the business, with managing the horses and, and everything else. So you've been here... 23 years. 23 years. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. From Alabama. Alabama. And did, had you had any previous horse, well, uh, I had horses? Well, I had horses. Oh, yes. I'm a, I'm Scottish, Irish, French, and Welsh. So I am a lover of the land. And I had horses in Alabama. And one of the things that I asked him when I first arrived, I said, would you teach me about wild horses? And he said, hmm, I had to learn. You're going to have to learn, too. So I spent the last 23 years Love that. <laughs> learning about wild horses and assisting him and building a tourism program and build, having picnic tables built and everything that you do running a nonprofit in which you want people to help support your nonprofit because we are a nonprofit and we exist on grants and donations and, and bequests. So it's very important that we do have a public outlet to where the public can come and see us if they so wish. But today, after 30 years, uh, we've grown. We've bought two additional pieces of, three additional pieces, small pieces of property to add to the, so we have about 12,000 acres here now. 12,000 acres. 12,000 acres. Wow. Um, but it is high desert, and as you can see behind you, that doesn't mean the dense tropical vegetation that you have in Pennsylvania and Alabama. Okay, this is high desert with only 8 to 12 inches of moisture a year. So the grass and the trees, you know, they adapt, they adjust. And so, but the good thing is, the horses that are here came from high desert. They came from places like Oh, Nevada and Wyoming and Colorado and um, the the interesting story is the the most recent arrivals arrived here from Louisiana. Mr. Hyde was in World War II and he was stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana in 1945 when he returned from the battlefields. He was at Fort Polk and this little horse wandered from the forest and and he met the horse and he decided, well, I guess I'll take it back to Yamsey. So he, he <laughs> buys a Jeep uh, to take it back to Yamsey. He housed it in the, the barracks, okay? And then at night he would let the horse out to graze the grass. And he was determined that he was gonna bring this horse that he found in Louisiana 
back to Yamsey, to the ranch in Yamsey that I went to when he was 13. So, but what happened was a lot of the troops were sent to the East Coast to, as the war de-escalated, and he ended up in the New York area, okay? And he, and this, this is a true story because I, I don't know how to make things up. <laughs> he had a brother-in-law and a sister that lived on the East Coast, and he goes to the brother-in-law, Hugo, who was just coming home from the, from the war, and he said, okay, I need to buy a Jeep. Not just a Jeep, but a Jeep with a bed on it, like a truck. And so he left New York, had bought the Jeep, surplus army Jeep, and he took soldiers. When they were released from the army or the war, they were given a little bit of money, but they weren't given transportation to get home. So oh. he, he had all these soldiers in the back of the Jeep playing poker. And his idea was he got a piece of the pot. Uh, and that gave him yes. the money to keep going. So he goes down into the New Orleans area to Fort Polk, and he picks up the horse. And as, as he goes along the United States, different soldiers are getting off. So he gets another group of soldiers, and he goes through Wyoming, and he goes through Nevada, and he goes through the Red Rock Desert, and then he, he's on the coast of California and Oregon. <clears throat> and everybody has then left except him and the horse. And her name was Sugarfoot. And Sugarfoot arrived at Yamsey, lived there for many years with the family, and became a ranch horse because a, a plantation walking horse is like sitting in a rocking chair. And now, where did that horse come from in Louisiana? Well, Napoleon used to own the, all the area in Louisiana, okay? You remember that from history, the Louisiana Purchase? Indeed, yes. Okay, the Louisiana Purchase was not just Louisiana. It was all of the United States all the way up to Canada. I didn't know that till I did some research. It was the largest land purchase that the United States had ever made. But Napoleon was broke because he had all had all these battles and he needed to sell it right. to the United States <laughs> to pay off his war debt. So... The Spanish and the French brought horses into the Louisiana, this, that part of the country, 500 years ago, okay, when Napoleon still owned it, and the, and the French and the Spanish were there. So you had all these little pockets of horses in the Kasachi Forest, north of New Orleans, okay? If you've okay. ever been to New Orleans, it's yes, very indeed. dense oh, vegetation. Yes. So the Army and the Forest Service now own that piece of forest and the forest service is a great um not a great animal lover and so the forest service and the army said these horses are trespassing these 200 something horses left over from when napoleon was here they gotta go any way that, that they can, they got to go. So, of course, you have a lot of yeah. women who love horses. And there was a lady named uh, Amy. And she, as they would round up horses, she would try to find people who found them. So there were 17 that were kept from May until September in a um, animal control unit. And I apologize, I can't remember the name. It was a... It was a it's a parish there in Louisiana, and they kept the horses for four months, three months, oh. until we could they could find a place for 17 horses. And so finally, I said, they can come here. So Best Friends in Kanab, Utah, another animal sanctuary, arranged for transportation. We got the horses ready, and they arrived here in s the late September of this year. Ironically... What is that the ceremony of? The anniversary of, of 1988, the first horses arriving. But the connection was that in 1945, Dayton Hyde encountered these horses in Louisiana. And I said, we have to bring them here in honor of Dayton Hyde's Sugarfoot that he took from those, the Kasachi Forest to Yamsey because they have worth, they have value. They're not very big horses. They're, they're ponies really is what they are because the Spanish never had very large horses. They mostly had pony stock. And so that's our most recent, most recent um, 
horses coming into the program. So that's a, to me, that's our, um, not <coughs> only are we com commemorating Dayton Hyde and his life, but we're also saving the life of those 17 horses that had nowhere else to go. And in that case, could they potentially wind up in slaughter? Situation? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And there's a lots of horses that go through the kill bars in Louisiana. I mean, a lot of the horses that have come here over the years ended up, in fact, um, it's not a very happy thing that we know that people send horses to slaughter, but they're here now and they're safe and they're not going anywhere. And then if, again, earlier I was speaking with Jason, who, yes. who works this property, yes. and there are the rescue horses, yes. and then as well as there is a separate, or I don't know if it separates the right word, but across the, the little river mm -hmm. over there very wild yeah uh, to the point where they he was saying that they really only drop hay or mm -hmm. any any feed over there in this time of year because they're coming out of winter <clears throat> right. they might be a little bit leaner things weren't so great uh, right. uh, we've heard multiple times today right. already mm -hmm. there was it was a very hard winter here yes so they feed them now but other than that they're truly on their own on yes. the other side just but living the do, way they do we do invite them to come over to your breakfast buffet that you helped with this morning aha uh -huh, yes. okay the <laughs> gates are open but as you see these across the river here oh yeah they do not want to come over here they can come if they want to but they're right there behind you on the hillside but there's no but they're not being like herded over here. Nobody's no pushing they them can to... come if they want to come Completely the breakfast open. buffet is always welcome always welcome <laughs> always open and what happens once they start the grass greens up then the breakfast buffet is not so important and the horses start drifting just drifting back because they really prefer this wild side they really don't want especially the ones that have come to us from the BLM that have gone through numerous adoptions numerous homes and it's like forget it I don't want to be touched. I don't want to be looked at. I'm a wild horse. So we'll the best you're going to see is me across the river. And now for, for visitors coming through okay. here, um, what can they expect to see here? And what kind of, like options do they have as far as you know, tours and things like that for when they come to the sanctuary? Right. Um, we are limited tourism now, okay, mainly just on Saturday because we don't have any tour drivers. But starting the 1st of May, we offer three-hour tours. People can come and go out in an SUV, kind of like you did this morning, okay. out to the wild horse herds. And we have cabins. We have three accommodations that people can stay in and then spend two days, three days, five days a week and take tours or maybe even help do something around like fill up water troughs or whatever you know um, tourists that come here are may almost as amazed as you are <laughs> and it's only to be fair for everyone listening or watching out there this isn't my first trip here but it is the first time i got to see the behind the scenes actually Correct. The, 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 the breakfast Correct. buffet as you said um humbling i think is one of the things you're on first of all the scenery here is incredible yes and then you're just seeing a true herd and there are you, i don't know how to describe i do not have the words it's one of the things where i, I implore you everyone listening or watching this come here yes you it's first-hand experience necessary almost well and they can also be partners with us in saving the land and providing a home for america's wild horses you're actually leading me to one of my next questions yes. is that like what can just people say that maybe you can't make it out here maybe right. it's just not 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 the right, right. time for you right. there are ways to support right by Correct. we have the internet now and there we is a the website internet. and we have a, a wildmustangs.com is our website uh you can support a horse for a day you can buy hay for the whole herd for a day you can buy cake and we call it cake but it's actually a grain product for the horses it's high protein oh. uh, you can sponsor a horse you can name a horse Ooh. you can become a, a forever friend of a horse so there's numerous ways that you can help support we are a nonprofit and we are supported by grants donations sponsorships and a limited tourism Very 
So that's everyone listening. You can make a difference. Here. You can make a Absolutely difference. Absolutely make a difference here, even if you've never set foot on the property. And trust me, if you do ever set foot on the property, you will see how well any support you offer. Yes. Is it's all being put to exceptionally good use. Yes. And again, twelve thousand acres is not a small parcel. No. And how many? I don't know. If it's, hard to get an accurate count but around how many horses well we have hundreds yeah. and we we more or less have them down here we have them kind of in groups and part of that is so we can if you had all of the horses in one group there would be some horses that didn't get chocolate chips in their cookies okay because horses don't like to share so this is a group and this particular group of horses over here can go all the way down to the river bridge. Okay? okay. So they have, but they do have a fence. Okay. They can at certain times go up the canyon. Okay. Then the, <clears throat> there's a group behind the house there and they can go anywhere they want to. So there's maybe 80 there, 80 there. You saw probably 150. So we kind of put that. them, that's, livestock management or wild horse management that you put them in different locations that doesn't mean that they can't come together if they want to but so that you can adequately take care of everybody the main thing that horses need is water and forage and when you don't have enough grass then you have to provide hay and then they need their friends and they need their space they want to be go where they want to go do what they want to do isn't that a good song do what i want to do go where i want to go that's horse for you they don't want to be ridden they don't want i mean but they will graciously give you of their time and that's that's the thing about a tour you didn't get to experience that this morning but you have in the past i'm sure where they just come up to the car yeah. they're not looking for food they wouldn't mind an apple okay there's a few that really like apples and carrots but but because they didn't grow up with apples and carrots they they haven't developed a fondness for them but i feel social, like that right? america baby boomers americans and not just americans around the world we have supporters uh took a reservation yesterday from belgians i have one coming from switzerland one from france wow. one from poland so and so we obviously are doing a good job of finding people that want to come here uh, but then again we're not mount rushmore we don't want to have too many people coming down the road we are not disneyland we are the real thing nothing is made up here and our horses are our best advocates for themselves you know they come up at you they're willing to teach you if you're willing to listen now what i've learned from from these horse herds is it takes a whole herd to raise a foal and if the foal is misbehaving the ante over here no don't do that you know and society as we know it has changed and we don't have the extended families that are raising children that they did when i was a child i never did anything that i didn't want my grandmother or my mother to know okay and these horses are kind of the same way they really have a tight social bond and and they might like there's over here there's a mother and daughter but if they don't have a daughter and they don't have their mother they will form a friendship herd with horses of like mind and they will travel together when you see them go get water they don't all go rushing down to the water they go in groups because in the wild the predators are the most vicious around the water hole so they're very sensitive they go when we see them come off the hill to drink in the river they drink and they turn around and they run back because that's when they're most uh, vulnerable to the predators and we do have predators on the property but that's a natural ecosystem to have predators that's life right absolutely i call them protagonists protagonists make us do a better job right you wouldn't do it if you didn't think uncle sam was looking at you and wanting you to pay taxes next week so <laughs> <laughs> right uh, oh, yeah man. yeah 
And so they perfect. can get a tax deduction by donating to us. Yeah, that was the other thing. Yeah, absolutely. And they can leave a bequest in their will. You want to help something go on into the future? Leave a bequest in your will. If you don't need your money after your death, leave it to the horses because the horses will use it. And again, this is, this, I implore you to come here and see the work that is being done yes. here. Because this, again, it looks to me like I grew up in southeastern Pennsylvania around farms. This obviously has slightly more mm -hmm. impressive scenery than I was used to. But it, it is a working farm. We got here around... Say, I saw you drive in, and like I apologize. Yes. Oh no, that was fine. We were, that was the point was to get here early yes. so we could kind of so see. So what all did you see? We saw well, Jason was yeah. amazing. As just gave us a little bit of the breakdown yeah. about the property and um, a little bit of history about mm -hmm. the types of horses that were mm -hmm. here, and basically saying that the Mustang is a, not his words, but what I heard was it's kind of a, a almost a mutt. Right. It's a lot mm -hmm. of different crossbreeds between like Morgans yes, and yes, standards yes, and every yes. like just so you get like because I was telling him about a draft horse that I used to have when I was a kid, uh -huh. and he'll said if you look closely you can see yes, some the of the, the same mm -hmm. characteristics on these horses. It won't be a true draft, but it'll have you know the little like the feather around the, the the feet. Well, if the, you the tested the blood of a horse that came from public land you might have 35 different blood types because remember in American history, they landed on the East Coast and they traveled across the country in wagon trains to Oregon and California and they had horses with them. And very seldom did they geld studs back then. So a horse gets away and he goes into the wild and he, you know, propagates. And so, uh, but we do have a lot of pure as pure as you can have American horses that were created from blood types from other countries that came in here. You have your draft horses, you have your, we have some Lusitanos that have Portuguese Ooh, bloodline. Yes. We have, you know, um, those little Kasachi horses tested out that they have a, a Pasofino blood in them. They have three different blood types in them and Spanish and French, and they haven't really, in the 500 years that they've been there, changed their blood type, you know? Wow. Yeah, I, know. I did see quite a few paints. If I, uh, we do have yeah, some paints. Is paints it? are pretty. People like color. Very beautiful. You know, a pretty horse gets petted quicker than an ugly horse, but right. we don't have any ugly horses. All of, no, say, there are no ugly horses. No. They all deserve petting. Yeah. Yeah. If they want it, on the yeah. wild side, if they come up to you, cool. That's it. But <laughs> let they're doing their thing. If you could, uh, if there's one thing or anything that you just would like to tell the general public of that who maybe have never heard of this place or are thinking about coming here, like just a, a message to them about why they should yes. come check, check you out. Yes, one of the quotes, and I'll, I'll quote Mr. Hyde because not only is was he a tremendous inspiration to many. He also was a, a prolific writer and we have many of his books in our gift shop. And one of the things that touched my heart was he said that man does not have dominion over the earth as most religions say, but rather caregivers, caretakers of our fellow travelers. In other words, we don't own it. We're just supposed to take care of it. And that, to me, really is a, is a chord in my heart that we don't own it. We're supposed to be responsible and take care of it. We have a responsibility to take care of all the animals, all the beings, the water. We have the responsibility to keep the water clean. Um, and we are preserving the land and providing a haven of hope for American wild horses. And what I have found over the 23 years I've been here, that the donor, the visitor, a lot of them are women, okay? Women like horses, but they're from places you would never expect. They could be from Switzerland. They could be from Pennsylvania. They could be from California. But they have a, in their heart a hope for the future. And that's one of the things that, that this place represents, hope. 
that you can come here and you can one day there might not be that many wild horses on public land you can come here and see wild horses you can see natural a river flowing through it you can see uh, the Native American petroglyphs you can feel like America was 300 years ago amazing and that 100% second that mm -hmm. absolutely you have to see it to believe it yes if not if nothing else go to wildmustangs.com mm -hmm. with check an out S. the site yeah with an s wildmustangs.com check out the site yes. see what they're doing uh they have a facebook presence mm -hmm. and um, instagram as well yes and we will be linking to that in these posts so you'll hopefully Good. on the video you'll see that flash up on the screen right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. um susan thank you so much you're so this welcome has been incredible informational and just, uh, Again, cannot describe the beauty the through beauty this microphone. Is, Hopefully, our pictures, our video does it at least some sort of justice. If you look over you can see some. Well, that's another piece of property that we just recently purchased. You can see the houses. That's the hill property. We call it Mustang Meadows. There is a group of horses across the river. Can you see them? Just little dots? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, we kind of, like I said, our goal is to add more land so that we can provide more homes for wild horses, but land requires money indeed and if someone wanted to help us purchase more land we would be more than happy to talk to them Susan, you guys hear that yes you guys hear that <laughs> more land means more horses yes. yes means more opportunities for you to come visit correct and check out the magnificent magnificent black hills of south correct. dakota correct again i cannot thank you enough for allowing us to come here Absolutely. and film it has already been an amazing day and i don't even think it's noon right <laughs> so i think we're gonna wrap up this interview but we have much more to shoot so okay. for those of you watching the video stay tuned for those of you on audio thank you very much for your time again susan thank you and Absolutely. your staff here this is jason cnf worldwide signing off take it easy nomads cnf worldwide for nomads everywhere this broadcast was produced by cnf limited for nomads everywhere contents of this broadcast are the property of CNF Limited. All rights are reserved. For more information about CNF publications, contact us at 305-707-4024. Find us on the web at cnfltd.com.